<clears throat> Hello everyone. Um, so this is my first video that I'm going to post for the readings that we're doing uh, for the next two weeks. Um, bear with me here because I am currently having my phone stacked on a bunch of soup cans and there may be some technical difficulties that arise because of that. <clears throat> also, I think my cat is using the litter box, so please excuse him. <laughs> um, Alright, so I'm mainly doing this because obviously whenever it is that we go through the readings, I normally like for us to annotate, so I want for us to, you know, stay in that habit. And um, for me to provide further explanation, I just feel like this is the best way to go about that. So uh, for English 4, the first reading that I had assigned for you all is uh, The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. Um, so Niccolo Machiavelli, he lived from 1469 to 1526, 1527, and he's really known for, uh, being a writer during the Renaissance, uh, time, and, uh, he's from Italy, I want to say yes. So, <clears throat> during the Renaissance, Sir Thomas More and other scholars assumed that morality had a central role in politics. So morality is just, of course, like, what is right, what is wrong, so it's sort of like this, um... The, the debate between what is right and wrong when it comes to ruling in politics. Um, Italy's Niccolo Machiavelli broke with this tradition, arguing that rulers should ignore moral concerns that interfere with their ability to govern. Machiavelli's political treatise, uh, The Prince, earned him both earned him such notoriety that the term Machiavellian was coined to refer to as a ruthless drive for power. Today, he is considered the founder of the modern field of political science. <clears throat> Niccolo Machiavelli was born into a prominent but impoverished family in Florence, Italy. In 1498, when he was only 29, Machiavelli landed an important job in the Florentine government that required considerable travel. His travels provided him with an insider's view of various rulers' strategies and policies. In 1512, the Republic of Florence fell and the Medici, a wealthy family that had once ruled Florence, returned to power. Machiavelli attempted to <clears throat> curry fa favor with, with the Medici, but was instead relieved of his post. In 1513, Machiavelli's political career effectively ended when he was accused of being an accomplice in a conspiracy against the Medici and was briefly imprisoned. <clears throat> Although Machiavelli was eventually released from prison, there was no place for him in the Medici government. He spent much of his remaining years writing. During this period, he composed The Prince, detailing how a principality should be ruled, and a companion work, Discourses on the First Ten Books of Livy, uh, focusing on how a republic should be ruled. Machiavelli dedicated The Prince to Lorenzo de' Medici, hoping to regain political favor. Finally, in 1519, he succeeded in partly reconciling with the family when they appointed him Florence's official historian. He worked on a history of Florence and on several other commissions until he died. Because The Prince was published in 1532 after Machiavelli's death, he never experienced the controversy surrounding his work. Most early readers of The Prince were scandalized by its message and by its disregard of morality and ethical rules. But over time, the treatise uh, changed people's perception of government. For hundreds of years, leaders have used The Prince as a guide to wielding political power. So, uh, I, to go off of that, this is very much a uh, more political uh, piece of writing. <clears throat> and again, really, Machiavelli really wrote this um, this treatise in an attempt to uh, get, have political favor because he was, I, as it said, that he was dismissed by the uh, government and he wanted to write this so that uh, he would sort of like get pardoned and that he could come back and uh, go into Italy again because I think that he was basically sort of like banned from that area. Um, so he wrote The Prince as a way to gain political favor. It was just basically him talking about like the way to rule, the talking about like looking at history and looking at different rulers and their approach to ruling. And it did become a pretty like, um, like it says right there, it was a guide to wielding political power. And uh, some pretty like notable names within history such as like Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, like uh, people that ran fascist regimes did use the prince as a way to obtain power um, because there is often sort of like this argument within the prince that um, is it better to be loved or feared? Um, 
And ultimately, I think that Medici, he says that you should be like as a ruler, you should be both loved and feared. But if you have to choose between both, it's better to be feared than loved. And that is really where, like I said, a lot of like these fascist regimes, uh, such as like Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, that they took over um, in that aspect of fear. So <clears throat> uh, Niccolo, just some like fun facts on him is no Niccolo Machiavelli always changed, cha uh, always changed into his finest clothing before sitting down to write. He dedicated the prince to Lorenzo de' Medici, who probably never read it, and he enjoyed pranks and jokes. All right, so this was sort of like the, and it would have been, I guess, like the journal prompt normally that we would have done is that, would you rather be loved or respected? And really what it means by respected is just like feared. So would you rather be loved or feared? That's something to sort of like take into account, like in before going into reading this. Um, <clears throat> for myself, I guess I'm not going to go too much in my like personal opinion on it. But um, of course, I guess that when it comes to ruling, there is like a little bit of aspect that you have to have both. But I don't know if I would necessarily say that you have to have fear more than love, because obviously that has ended like very badly in history. Um, so just to sort of recap a little bit of like some vocab that we need to go over. Um, so this is overall an argument. An argument is speech or writing that expresses a position on an issue or problem and supports it with reasons and evidence. In The Prince, Machiavelli presents his revolutionary argument on what it takes to be an effective ruler. Machiavelli uses these rhetorical elements to build his arguments. He uses irony, which is a contrast between expectation and reality. So, for example, it says, therefore, it is necessary for a prince who wishes to maintain himself to learn how not to be good. So it's ironic because I guess like when you think about a prince and a ruler, um, it's to learn how not to be good, that that's like the effective way of like achieving uh, power <clears throat> in order to maintain himself. It's sort of ironic because it's um, contrasting the expectation versus reality, the expectation that we have of rulers um, that they should be good, right? But in reality, that they need to learn how not to be good in order for them to rule effectively. Uh, there's also paradox. It's an apparent contradiction that is actually true. So here, is it better to be loved more than feared or feared more than loved? The reply is one ought to be both feared and loved, which is something I sort of talked about. And this is a paradox because it's a contradiction uh, that is actually true. Um, talking about like this, is it better to be feared or loved? Well, it's actually better to be both feared and loved. And I guess that's an example of a paradox. Uh, there's also subtleties. Uh, making an argument using skillful distinctions. Uh, he must not deviate from what is good if possible, but be able to do evil if forced. So this is just, um, again, making that argument... Uh, skillful distinctions i'm trying to see like exactly it's just it's just doing like it in a subtle way that he must not deviate from what is good if possible but be able to do evil if forced again sort of this whole like argument between um ruling and having uh the good the morality behind it or not the evil part of it that um was taken into account like within a lot of like the fascist rulers that i had mentioned before like hip Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, that they used the prince in a way to obtain power, but they uh, read it, not misinterpreted, because I think that Machiavelli did really, like, approach it in a way that, like, went against morals, um, but they took it, like, maybe a little bit too literally and used that to obtain their power, not in a good way, right? <clears throat> So we'll go ahead and begin reading The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. In the 15th and 16th centuries, Italy was a collection of city-states. Some were republics and some were principalities under the control of one person or family. During this period of political turmoil, Machiavelli wrote The Prince, a work in which he outlines the means by which a state can achieve peace and stability. It now remains to be seen what are the methods and rules for a prince as regards, as regards his subjects and friends? And as I know that many have written of this, I fear that my writings about it may be deemed presumptuous, differing as I do, especially 
in this matter from the opinions of others. But my intention being to write something of use to those who understand, it appears to me more proper to go to the real truth of the matter than it than to its imagination, and many have imagined republics and principalities which have never been seen or known to exist in reality. For how we live is so far removed from how we ought to live that we we that he who abandons what is done for what ought to be done will rather learn to bring about his own ruin than his preservation. So this is just sort of him establishing his argument. Obviously, he's going to be talking about the methods and rules for how a prince should uh, rule in regards to both his subjects and his friends. Um, and it's used for those who understand. Uh, for, yeah, so I guess that's basically it. It's just, again, just sort of establishing the, this argument in the first paragraph. <clears throat> so... A man who wishes to make a profession of goodness in everything must necessarily come to grief um, among so many who are not good. Therefore, it is necessary for a prince who wishes to maintain himself to learn how not to be good and is to and to use this knowledge and not use it according to the necessity of the case. So I just put here that this is basically and this is where we're seeing that um, I want to say which example this was again. I'm just going to go back to check on that. It is I irony, and I might just like put a little note here that this is sort of ironic, right? Um, because he's talking about like how a prince should learn how to rule effectively is that they need to learn how to not be good. Um, and really, this is just a way to use power, uh, using power depending on the situation to their own benefit. So if a prince can go about something or a ruler, right, the prince is the ruler, if they can go about ruling in a way that they know that they can manipulate things and they can use things to their advantage, um, that it's ultimately for their own benefit that they're going to be able to obtain the power they seek, right? <clears throat> so leaving on one side then those things which concern only an imaginary prince and speaking of those that are real, I state that all men and especially princes who are placed at a greater height are reputed for certain qualities which bring them either praise or blame. Thus, one is considered liberal, another miserly. One a free giver, another uh, rapacious, rapacious, which is uh, greedy or grasping. So this is um, we're gonna see a lot of like uh, con like contrast between like what a ruler is or should like how different rulers rule like one being cruel one being merciful one being a giver one being greedy um let's see so one cruel another merciful one a breaker of his word another trustworthy one effeminate which just means unmanly um and suliam suliaminous which is uh timid or cowardly another fierce and high-spirited one humane another haughty one lash vicious, which is a uh, sexual, another chaste, which is to like not be sexual. One frank, another astute, one hard, another easy, one serious, another frivolous, one religious, another an unbeliever, and so on. So if anything, I might just like make a little bit notes on like the different types of rulers that, you know, not all rulers are the same. Some rule differently, and it just depends on the individuality of that person, right? <clears throat> I know that everyone will admit that it would be highly praiseworthy in a prince to possess all the above-named qualities that are reputed good, but as they cannot all be possessed or observed, human conditions not permitting of it, it is necessary that he should be prudent enough to avoid the scandal of those vices which would lose him this state. So I just put a note here that use the qualities of one's advantage that will help gain favor. Because at the end of the day, look, we're all humans, right? No one's perfect. We make mistakes. And um, there's certain flaws about our characters that um, we are constantly working on in order to become better people, right? But um, ultimately, that like when it comes to ruling, that we need to know how to play that game right right that we need to know like which characteristics to use and portray ourselves in order to be seen as an effective ruler because if we're focusing too much on the negative aspects or the other uh parts of us as humans a part of the human condition 
um, that it's going to portray us in an unfavorable light, right? The, the kind of ruler that we don't really want to place our trust in. Mm, let's see. I can't remember exactly where it was that I left off, so I'm just going to start from right here. Um, and guard himself, in, if possible, against those which will not lose it for him. But if it were not able to, he can indulge them with less scruple. And yet he must not mind incurring the scandal of those vices without which it would be difficult to save the state. For if one considers well, it would be found that some things which seem virtues would, if followed, lead to one's ruin, and some others which appear vices result in one's greater security and well-being. So again, this is just what I was talking about, that choose what will help gain political favor, not what is morally right. So even though something may seem right to us that at the end, of, like when it comes to ruling, that there are choices that need to be made within politics that aren't necessarily considered good or right. But at the end of the day, it is the right decision to make because it's going to um, be the benefit for the majority of people. <clears throat> I say that every prince must desire to be considered merciful and not cruel. He must, however, take care not to misuse his mercifulness. Caesar Borgia was considered cruel, but his cruelty had brought order to the Romana, united it, and reduced it to peace and fealty. If this is considered well, it will be seen that he is really much more merciful than the Florentine people, who, to avoid the name of cruelty, allowed Pistoia to be destroyed. A prince, therefore, must not mind incurring the charge of cruelty for the purpose of keeping his subjects united and faithful, for with a very few exam with, with a very few examples he will be more merciful than those who, from excess of tenderness, allow discords disorders to arise, from whence spring bloodshed and rapine, for these are a rule injure the whole community while the extent ex executions carried out by the prince injure only individuals. And so this whole thing, I think it, it was really focusing on the aspects of cruelty. So I'm just going to make that note there that there are, even though that we want for like our rulers to have like a, you know, mercy, that sometimes we do need to use cruelty or cruel ways in order to, uh, again, benefit the majority. So, I mean, I guess, obviously, it's not really cruel, sort of the situation that we're in, uh, to an, ex an extent in terms of, like, social isolation, I guess. But um, the decision for us to have to do this uh, social distancing and uh, thing, it, it's, it, it's, again, these are, these are choices that are made by the rulers in order to uh, keep the majority uh, safe. So... I, again, it's not really necessarily like to the extent of this. I'm pretty sure there's more like better examples, but this is like the the thing that comes to my my head, uh, the top of my head at the first thought. Um, I mean, I, if you want to get into it, there was also sort of like the uh, I guess recently like topics of like um, within Obama's presidency. I know that there was like some like raids that they they did air raids like over uh, certain countries in the Middle East. That this was sort of like seen as a cruel tactic, but again, it it was done. Um, in order to keep our country safe or to protect, protect the majority. It's to benefit the whole people. From this arises the question whether it is better to be loved more than feared or feared more than loved. The reply is that one ought to be both feared and loved, which again, this was the example of a paradox, right? Um, but as it is difficult for the two to go to the, together, it is much safer to be feared than love. So I just put here on the side that this is what he's saying, that fear is greater than love, that in the end as rulers that um, it, it, it's better to like have more power and to have more people follow you, that the best way to obtain that is through fear. If one of the two has to be wanting... So, yeah, between fear and love, again, saying that fear is the greater of the two. For it may be said of men in general that they are ungrateful, voluble, dissemblers, anxious to avoid dangers, and covetous of gain, as long as you benefit them. They are entirely yours. They offer you their blood, their goods, their life, and their children. As I have before said, when the necessity is remote, but when it approaches, they revolt." 
And the prince who has relied solely on their words without making their preparations is ruined. For the friendship which is gained by purchase and not through grandeur and nobility of spirit is bought but not secured. And at a pinch is not to be expended in your service. And men have less scruple in offending one who makes... Okay, wait, before I uh, add on to that, again, this is just talking about the fear fear and love. And then it also talks about like with friendships. And I think it mentioned something about uh, gained by purchase that uh, sort of like buying your way um, through things. Because again, through like rulers, people that rule, those with money are the ones with power, right? Maybe I might just put that, that money is power. But it also kind of goes hand in hand with this idea of fear. <clears throat> and men have less scruple in offending one who makes himself loved than one who makes himself feared. For love is held by a chain of obligation, which men being selfish is broken whenever it serves their purpose. But fear is maintained by a dread of punishment, which never fails. Um, so I just put here that basically what he's saying is that love cannot be trusted because as a ruler, if you portray yourself in a loving way and that people love you, that they're going to walk over you, right? They're going to use things to their own benefit because that is the um, reality of human nature is that we're selfish and we want things for ourselves. Uh, we don't really like at the end of the day that we want things f to be for our own benefit, not really for the benefit of others, right? And uh, that fear is reliable because it's going to keep people in check, right? That if you have love, um, it's not really gonna keep people in check because again, that they're gonna be able to walk over you, they're going to misuse and mistreat you, that they're going to um, do things for their own benefit, not for the benefit of others. So still, a prince should make himself feared in such a way that if he does not gain love, he at any rate afford, avoids hatred. For fear and the absence of hatred may well go together and will always be attained by one who abstains from interfering with the property of his citizens and subjects um, or with their women. And when he is obliged to take the life of anyone, let him do so when there is a proper justification and manifest reason for it. But above all, he must abstain from taking the property of others, for men forget more easily the death of their father than the loss of their patrimony. So this is just sort of like talking about property. Mm. I'm trying to think exactly what it is. Well, hold on. It'll, it'll get to me in a bit, right? Uh, then also pretexts of seizing property are, are never wanting and one who begins to live by rapine will always find some reason for taking the goods of others, whereas causes for taking life are rarer than and more fleeting. So if anything, I, I think that this is just sort of like g bouncing off on that. It's just going on to like expand on his argument and just showing that, um, mm, let me backtrack a little bit. I think I'm going to make a note here. It just kind of has to do, again, with the selfishness of humanity. Like, wanting things for their own benefit. All right. But when the prince is with his army and has a large number of soldiers under his control, then it is extremely necessary that he should not mind being thought cruel. For without this reputation, he could not keep an army united or disposed to any duty. Among the noteworthy actions of Hannibal is numbered, numbered this, that although he had an enormous army composed of men of all nations and fighting in foreign countries, there never arose any dissension either among them or against the prince, either in good fortune or in bad. This could be due to anything but his inhumane cruelty. So again, this is just the use or necessity of cruelty and maybe just sort of the power of being cruel that 
ultimately it's what gets things done. Uh, which together with his infinite other virtues made him always venerated and terrible in the sight of his soldiers and without it his other virtues would not have sufficed to produce that effect. Thoughtless writers admire on the one hand his actions and on the other blame the principal causes of them. How laudable it is for a prince to keep good faith and live with integrity and not with astuteness everyone knows. Still the experience of our times show uh, those princes to have done great things who have had little regard for good faith and have been able to been able by astuteness to confuse men's brains and who have ultimately overcome those who have made loyalty their foundation. So I just put here that this kind of has to do with manipulation again, using like loyalty sort of as a way to get things, um, <clears throat> keep good faith and live with integrity that this is all just sort of maybe like a show that a lot of people like are doing because, um, there's like little regard for good faith. It's to confuse men's brains and ultimately it's just to gain their loyalty. So I'm, I just put here, it's manipulation possibly to gain loyalty. You must know then that there are two methods of fighting, the one by law and the other by force. The first method is that of men the second of beasts. So again, law is with men, force with beasts. But as the first method is often insufficient, one must have recourse to the second. It is therefore necessary for a prince to know well how to use both the beast and the man. So I just put here that you must fight uh, or a ruler must fight both by law and by force that they need to use both the man or um humanly like aspects of it but also like the beastly aspects of it again because ultimately in order to get what they want to gain power to gain control a prince being thus obliged to know well how to act as a beast must imitate the fox and the lion for the lion cannot protect himself from traps and the fox cannot defend himself from wolves one must therefore be a fox to recognize traps and a lion to frighten wolves so um, those that wish to be only lions do not understand this. Therefore, a prudent ruler ought not to keep faith when by so. Okay, well, before we get that, um, again, it's just, I just put a note here on the side that uh, an effective ruler, that they must be cunning and smart, but they also need to be powerful and frightening, that you need to find the balance between both. Uh, the balance between both to rule effectively. All right. So therefore, a prudent ruler ought not to keep faith when by so doing it would be against his interest and when the reasons which made him bind himself no longer exist. If men were all good, this precept would not be a good one. But as they are bad and would not observe their faith with you, so you are not bound to keep faith with them. Nor have legitimate grounds ever failed a prince who wished to, to show plausible excuse for the non-fulfillment of his promise. Of this one could furnish an infinite number of modern examples and show how many times peace has been broken and how many promises rendered worthless by the faith of princes and those who have been best able to Im imitate the fox have succeeded best but it is necessary to be able to disguise this character well and to be a great feigner and dissembler and men are so simple and so ready to to obey present necessities that one who deceives will always find those who allow themselves to be deceived so and on here i feel like this one was pretty straightforward i really just understand I got interrupted with a phone call. Anyways, so like I was saying, um, I feel like this one was pretty straightforward. And I'm just going to kind of recap a little bit like what I underlined. So it just talks about that. If It has to do, again, with this whole debate on morality, right? So what is good, what is not? Um, I'm just going to put like good versus bad. Um, so if men were all good... This precept would not be a good one, but as they are all bad. So he has a very like negative view, I guess, like on humankind. He's saying that human nature is bound for us to be.
be bad, make bad decisions, bad choices, and would not observe their faith with you. So you are not bound to keep faith with them. That That's sort of like the um, outlook that a lot of rulers or people have to have because they can't really like trust. And I think that that just kind of has to do with it. There's a lack of trust um, with rulers to their people or even among their um, helpers, whoever it is that's helping them rule. Uh, peace has been broken, promises rendered. It is necessary to be able to disguise this character well. That one who deceives will always find those who allow themselves to be deceived. So just to sort of, I guess, like put up a wall between um, you and other people, again, because of this lack of trust that we have when it comes to humanity. Humanity, like the selfishness of human beings and sort of the deceit and lies that come as a result of that. Thus it is well to seem merciful, and again, to seem merciful, not to actually be merciful, just to put up a front, to pretend, uh, to seem merciful, faithful, humane, sincere, religious, and also to be so. But you must have the mind so disposed that when it is needful to be otherwise, you may be able to change to the opposite qualities. And it must be understood that a prince, and especially a new prince, cannot observe all those things which are considered good in men, being often obliged in order to maintain the state, to act against faith, against charity, against humanity, and against religion. And therefore he must have a mind disposed to adapt itself according to the wind, and as the variations of fortune dictate, and as I said before, not deviate from what is good if possible, but be able to do evil if constrained." So I just put here, and this is just sort of what we're seeing throughout here is this idea of using power for what is necessary in order to gain what they want. Um, and it also talks here about the adaptability of a user as well, that he must be able to, he or she must be able to adapt according to the wind. Um, because even though that they may seem they're putting up this front, and I kind of want to make a note here that like this like fakeness, um, excuse my handwriting, but I'm just putting their like fakeness um, that a lot of like the rulers that they'll come about saying like showing themselves, portraying themselves as a certain way. But is that the reality of things? Is that actually how they are? Is that actually their morals? At the end of the day, not really, because they're only doing things to gain power for what is necessary. <clears throat> All right, so a prince must take great care that nothing goes out of his mouth which is not full of the above name five qualities and to see and hear him. He should seem to be all mercy, faith, integrity, humanity, and religion. So again, these are all the qualities that a good ruler should have in order to be looked to um, favorably in the public eye among the people that they want to see a ruler with mercy, faith, integrity, humanity, and religion, because that's what's going to gain them political favor. And nothing is more necessary than to seem to have the, this last quality for men in general judge more by the eyes than by the hands for everyone can see, but very few have to feel. Everybody sees what you appear to be, few feel what you are, and those few will not dare to oppose themselves to the many who have the majesty of the state to defend them. And in the actions of men, and especially of princes, from which there is no appeal, the end justifies the means. Let a prince therefore aim at conquering and maintaining the state, and the means will always be judged honorable and praised by everyone. For the vulgar is always taken by appearances and the issue of the events, and the world consists only of the vulgar. And the few who are not vulgar are isolated when the many have a rallying point in the prince. A certain prince of the present time, whom it is well not to name, never does anything but preach peace and good faith. But he is really a great enemy to both. And either of them, had, had he observed them, would have lost him state reputation on many occasions." So I just put here because this really kind of has to do with uh, maintaining an image for the public eye, even if it's not authentic. Again, because it's to do what? It's to gain power. Um, that we have to portray ourselves uh, for men in general, judge more by the eyes than by the hands for everyone can see, but very few have to feel. So it's whatever you're portraying that what they see visually is what they want to see what they want from a ruler but 
um, when it comes to like by their hands or actually feeling it out and, you know, seeing where things are going, that it's a little bit harder to judge it that way and to actually like um, say that you want for someone to rule in that way, if that makes sense. But mainly it has to do with just maintaining this image for the public, right? <clears throat> and um, that's it. So overall, for this reading as a whole, it just really has to do with the the effectiveness of a ruler, um, the argument about morality, whether a ruler should be good or bad, whether they should be loved or feared, and really the the ways that we need to approach or that rulers need to approach obtaining power, which that's up for you all to decide, I think, if you want to like think about that or talk um, with each other about this, maybe about the current um, political situation that's going on within this country within our own political rulers do you see any of the um beliefs or the politics that is presented in here currently now within politics or even within politics from different countries this is something for you all to think about uh when it comes to ruling when it comes to analyzing politics and when it comes to choosing an effective ruler that's going to um make uh, good changes and good decisions for the people as a whole so um go ahead and think about that uh hopefully the explanation and my notes and annotations sort of help you all to answer these questions again uh there's nine questions here of the nine you all may choose only like five to answer and again just keep write it on this sheet of paper, put it in a Google document for now until we decide what we're going to do after the two weeks comes up. Um, and then we're going to see where we head there if we go back to school or if we're going to continue doing online learning. <clears throat> Anyways, that's um, basically it. So this is the first video for now. Uh, thank you all. If you have any questions, just email me um, we can set something up online to talk about this reading. If you want further explanations, um, go ahead and get in contact with me as soon as possible. And that's it.